Hey guys, welcome back to Release the Craft, and Priscilla here with another episode of StoryCraft. And this one, you guys, I think is going to be pretty exciting today, because uh, as you guys know, for the month of May, I'm doing viewer requests, and this was a request I got a while ago in my email, actually. That is another way you can reach out to me. Um, but it was a request for a story about the the Danaids, the Danaids, I don't know how to say it. I've heard a lot of different takes on it, um, so it might change throughout the course of this story, um, but we are doing the story of the Danaids. Let's go with that. I feel confident in Danaids. I know it's wrong, uh, but it'll change. It'll change. Um, and this one should be a pretty quick story, all things considered, provided I don't get super rambly, so already, no promises. Bring snacks and your coffee or your tea, whatever you your beverage of choices. Um, and let's get into it, because I am excited. This story is um, a story from Greek mythology, but it is uh, it doesn't take place in Greece for the most part. Well, for half the story, it doesn't take place in Greece, because it actually starts in um, Africa. So we're going to go back there to the way, way long ago. Uh, once upon a time, there was a king named Belus. And um, he was the king of North Africa, just the entirety of North Africa, unspecified borders, North Africa. And he was the grandson of a naiad by the name of Io, who had been turned into a cow for the crime of, you'll never guess it, being one of Zeus's hookups. Um, I'll try to remember to do her story one day, but for right now, she turns into a cow, um, and to get away from the wrath of Hera and try to stay out of, like, her line of sight, she dips to Africa, and that's where King Belus, uh, his ancestors are born, and, you know, we come down the line, we get to King Belus. And, um, he marries another naiad named, um, Achero? Achero. No promises on pronunciations this time, guys. Um, and in case you were wondering, what, well, what's a naiad? Uh, naiads are water nymphs in Greek mythology, and they tend to exist near bodies of water, such as springs, waterfalls, and the rivers and lakes that you're used to. And um, together, uh, Bellus and his wife had uh, two sons. They had another son, but nobody gives a fuck about that guy. Um, but they had two sons who happened to be twins, um, Egyptus and Danaeus. And it's important to note that the twins absolutely never got along, and they definitely had some, like, daddy-based attention issues, um, because they would constantly bicker and try to one-up each other, and, you know, like, show off how much better they were than the other brother, and, um, this carried on all the way until, like, King Bellas died, and then even afterwards, because you never really get over your issues without therapy, and this is ancient Greece, so, uh, there wasn't a lot of that going on. Or it was ancient Africa, for the time being. Uh, so, Belus, um, before he dies, decides to divide his kingdom between his two sons. Cause, probably because, you know, they would tear it apart if they had to share. You know what I mean? So, he divides it up. And he gives uh, Danaeus Libya. So, he becomes the king of Libya. And Egyptus becomes the king of Arabia. Which, you're going to point out, is not attached to North Africa. At which point I will say, I know. But he also ruled that too. So, Egyptus, like, fucks off to Arabia, uh, Danaeus is setting up shop in Libya, and things seem to be pretty okay for a time being, because they had nothing, nothing but time on their hands, guys, and how did I know they had nothing but time on their hands? Um, because all they did was get busy, because Danaeus ends up having 50 daughters, and Egyptus ends up having 50 sons. And you heard me right, that's 50, 5 0 oh, 50 children each, um, both only having children of a specific gender, the odds were in their favor for that one, because how? Um, and sources are pretty divided on whether or not these children were all birthed by a single woman um, to each king, respectively. Not like one woman birthed 100, but they each had like a wife who birthed 50. Um, or if it was a bunch of like a big mix of like naiads and other human women. Um, and for the sake of the women, I'm just going to say it was many women. They had many affairs and wives and mistresses and what do you call them? Consorts and concubines. They had all the things because 
like uh, just imagine being a single person having to give birth to 50 children because this guy ain't got shit else to do also that would have taken like fucking forever you'd just be pregnant for like a decade straight and that's awful it'd be more than a decade so like logistically it doesn't work it's got to be a bunch of different women uh, it doesn't matter because the wives and the women um who birthed all these children don't come into play they don't matter in the story whatsoever um so shout out to those women for giving birth to a bunch of children of the same sex for their respective kings um so <laughs> After the birth of all these children, you know, they grow up and Egyptus is doing his thing. And his thing, you might be wondering, is um, westward expansion, um, especially after King Belus dies. He decides that he's going to move into West Africa and not just be king of Arabia. He's not satisfied with just that part of the world. Um, so he decides to move into uh, the north of Africa, moving westward towards Libya. And he ends up founding um, Egypt. Egyptus, Egypt, that's where it came from, according to this story. Um, and, you know, he continues to slowly expand westward. And this makes Danaeus really fearful for the state of his own kingdom. So in his fear, he commissions a ship to be built for himself and his 50 daughters. And then they just fuck off across the sea um, and just leave the entirety of their kingdom up to fate because he left nobody in charge. He just took his kids and he left and they sail across the sea to Argos. And once they get to Argos, you guys, um, Danaeus, he does something very Danaeus-like, let's just say, because he gets there and he tells the people that he meets there that he is to be the new king of Argos. Um, He's actually fated to be the new king, destined by the gods to be the new king of Argos. Like, the gods sent him to Argos to be the king. And he lays this on thick. Like, so thick that they're like, huh, that's weird, because we already have a king? Um, he might object, but you make a good argument. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> they tell the king about it. The king's like, uh pass and they're like but wait, 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 let's hear him out you know and so you know Danaeus once again pitches that he is um ordained by the gods to be the new king of Argos so the people all come together because you know Argos is very diplomatic in this time and they all sit around to talk about it all of the people of Argos are just chilling out all day having a big long chit chat about who would be the better king this guy who just showed up with 50 daughters who says he's like promised by the gods to be the new king or the king that they've had this entire time um and they talk about it so much that it actually gets so late that they're like i won't finish this discussion tomorrow it's not really that important there's no urgency there's no consequences to this decision if we don't make it quickly so they all go to bed <laughs> because they're like it's too late to keep talking about this i don't want to keep you guys up um and in the night, a wolf comes down from the mountains and slaughters a bunch of their cattle and the prize bull. Like, the head honcho bull also gets slaughtered by this wolf. And they're like, when they wake up in the morning, the people of Argos are like, this, this is a bad omen. This, this is a sign. If we don't make this guy a king, he's going to visit his wrath upon us like the wolf and we're, we're gonna, we're gonna die. <laughs> so we have to make him king. And so they boot out the old king and they make Danaeus the new king. And fortunately for them, Danaeus is actually a really good king. Like he's, he's got it down. Um, surprisingly, cause he just abandoned his last kingdom. Like it was nothing. Um, so they don't depose him and he like he manages to make Argos flourish underneath his rule and this is like I don't know a, like a couple of years in the making of this this whole process because you can't do anything quickly in ancient times right um but Argos is flourishing and Egyptus continues his uh his westward expansion and he didn't necessarily want to conquer Libya he didn't feel the need to because he's got 50 sons right um, and his 50 sons can marry his brothers, uh, 50 daughters, you know, like, they're just his nieces. It's not weird. It's ancient Greece. Um, and that would solve the problem of, like, who owns Libya for him, right? So he, he wasn't trying necessarily to conquer Libya, but he was trying to conquer Libya. Like, he, 
he was doing it in a roundabout way. Plus, like, you got 50 kids. You got to marry them off somehow. Why not use these 50 convenient other children of the opposite gender to, like, make it work? So, um... <laughs> So Egyptus sends his sons um, to Greece to uh, go find Danaeus and let them know that he, he wants them to marry Danaeus' daughters. And while they're sailing away, he takes up the throne in Libya um, and is now the official king of the entirety of North Africa, like his father was before him. So, I mean, it's basically exactly what Danaeus feared. That hunch was right. That's exactly what his brother wanted because he's now sitting in his old throne, right? Um, so the sons of Egyptus catch up to Danaeus and his daughters. You know, they get to the court at Argos and they're like, hey, um, our dad sent us um, to marry your daughters who are now being collectively referred to as the, 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 the oh gosh, speech impediment come through as the Danaeids <laughs> and um, demand that they, they're married, you know, like. Our our dad sent us here to marry your your kids, and um, you have to marry us. There's no other option. And Danaeus is like, um, I'm the king, and let me think about it. And while he's thinking about it, these 50 boys are all, like, sort of chuckling and talking amongst themselves in the courtroom, or the king's courtroom. And um, at some point, some of them start talking about how uh, their dad actually told them to uh, murder uh, the Danaeids if they refuse to wed. And Danaeus hears this because he has ears and he refuses. He's like, actually, no, you can't marry my daughters. <laughs> I just decided it was so weird. It's almost like uh, the universe told me, no, you can't marry my daughters. And they're like, okay, fine. Uh, bet we're gonna do it anyways um so what they do uh the 50 sons of egyptus is they lay siege to the entire city of argos they block off the food supply and they like block off the river so the city isn't getting any water or food uh during this siege and it gets to the point where like you know the people are starving they're dehydrated as fuck their skin not looking so great you no matter how much moisturizer you can't replace water um and so eventually Danaeus has to give in to their demands um because he isn't exactly in a position to keep refusing he can't just make water um so he concedes and um then he announces that he will take on the role of deciding which daughter marries which one. And it's freaking shenanigans because he's like, you guys look cute together. I'm going to put you two together. You know, your names almost sound the same. So you guys can be together. That won't be confusing whatsoever. Uh, I just think that you should marry that one because you're pretty and he's ugly. And I think that would be really funny. Also, for all the rest of you I don't actually give a fuck about, I'm going to put all your names in this helmet and just pick them at random. So... You marry him. You marry him. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. You marry that guy. Um, and matches up the 50 sons with the $50. Th this is how he does it, right? Uh, he doesn't care about his kids in this capacity, even though he just, like, let the whole city be, like, under siege because he was like, no, I actually care about my daughters. But when it came up to matchmaking, he was like, no, nah, I don't give a fuck about anything here. Um, so... He sets them all up super romantically, you know, and he decides that he's not rolling over completely just because he gave into their demands to marry his daughters. Um, he comes up with this really clever plan. So what he does is he gifts all of his daughters a very fine, golden, very sharp hairpin to wear in their hair for their wedding days. And he tells them all that um, all their husbands are going to try to kill them. So they need to kill their husbands on the wedding night, uh, lest they be dominated by them. And um, I'm just going to pause real quick in the story here for you guys. This major content warning uh, coming up. All the triggers, like, it's about to get non-consensual here. So if that's not cool, end the story now. Dip out. Maybe come back in like two minutes. The story will still be here. Um, but uh, on the night of their wedding, all the women do exactly as their father ordered. Um, they wait until the men are finished having their way and uh, are sleeping it off to then stab every one of these men in the heart with their shiny gold hairpins. Um, all of them do this except for Hypermenestra, who spares her husband, Lanacus. 
that's rough. I don't think that's how you say that. Um, because unlike his brothers, he didn't try to assault his wife on their wedding night and actually honored her wish to stay a virgin. So they got married, they got to their bedchamber, and she was like, I want to be a virgin. And he was like, cool. And they just sat down and they chilled and they talked all night and had a really good time. And instead of that, you know, they, they could make this work. They could get along. And you know how things do in most of these fairy tale stories, they're in love by morning. So she was like, I absolutely can't kill this man. There's no way. And Danaeus, upon uh, seeing that all of his daughters but one had actually followed his orders, had Hypernestra and Linceus, Lin oh, I don't know how you say his name, Lincaus, uh, sent to appear before the court of Argos for the crime of not killing somebody. Which surprisingly um, didn't really hold up in court because uh, the people were like, nah. <laughs> is that a crime though? Um, it's actually for the crime of like trying to help him escape. That's what he sent her there for. But essentially that was what he was sending her for was for not murdering her husband. And during the court proceedings, um, Aphrodite actually steps in and she spares the two lovers because, you know, they showed true, genuine like affection for each other. And, you know, Hypermenestra was a real one for trying to save her husband on the night of her wedding by not murdering him and then trying to help him escape afterwards. So she saves him and helps them establish um, sort of a long life of prosperity. They become like the future king and queen of Argos um, and have a dynasty that lasts for a very long time. And you might be wondering, um, sure, all this is great, like this is going on, but what did Egyptus do? upon hearing the news that his sons had all died. Well, let me tell you what, guys. He didn't know his sons died. He actually arrived late to the wedding festivities um, the day after his sons had been murdered. And when he hears the news, he's like, oh, shit. Um, I thought I was, like, gangster because I took over all of Africa or all of North Africa. But um, my brother just murdered all of my children. And that's actually heartbreaking. So he flees the country and goes to another country and then just dies of grief. Um, because abandoning your kingdom runs in the family. So I guess North Africa is free. And so is Arabia because the, like Egyptus didn't care. He just fucked off and died. Um, because his plan to force his daughters to like, forced themselves on his nieces didn't work out great for him in the long run who would have thought and after having his little like temper tantrum um you know over hypomenestra not killing her husband Danaeus thinks everything's going to be great now because um in the court of public opinion they have decided not to charge the 49 other Danaeids um because they figured you know you were following orders given to you by your father so like filial piety is important but also you were taking an action to prevent yourself from being horribly assaulted and murdered so we're gonna let this one go we're gonna let it go so Denise is like great um but then because this whole thing just rings of shenanigans and they're like yeah actually you told your daughters to murder um their husbands and that's not cool for like a god sent king um Linkaus, Hypermenestra's husband, becomes the new king of Argos, and his first order as king is to have Danaeus slain for the murder of his brothers. Because, like, he had he had some hard feelings. I'm not gonna say he had no hard feelings, because that's, you know, like, he probably knew his brothers were creeps, but he was like, they're still my brothers, bro. Um, so yeah, he had Danaeus slain, and the other uh, forty nine like Danaids were um, able to remarry um, who they chose to afterwards. Um, although, like, it was a little bit slow going because the men of Argos were like, uh, "Are you gonna murder us on your wedding night too?" So a couple of guys were offered up as sacrificial lambs to see if they would get murdered on their wedding nights, and when they didn't, then everybody else was like, "Oh, we can we can go for it. Like, it's good." Um, so the other 49 Danaeids were able to get married and live happily lives, and uh, Linkaus and Hypermenestra ended up living a very long, happy life with happy children who carried on their names for quite a while afterwards. Unfortunately, though, this isn't like a 100% happy ending story because when uh, the 49 Danaids go to the underworld, they are judged very harshly when they get to the underworld by the underworld judges who are like, yeah, you did a murder? You did a murder? <laughs> That's not okay. You knowingly plotted a murder and you did it. Um, 
So as their punishment in the underworld, they were forced to carry water in jugs, but the jugs were full of holes. So they could never like fill up their jug and walk it, you know, to wherever the fuck they were supposed to walk it to. I don't know. Um, I didn't research that deep into this. Um, So they would have to continuously walk back to refill their jugs and they just have to walk around carrying leaky jugs of water for eternity as their punishment. And so they're still walking to this day and that's kind of balls. Um, but you know, I guess I, they didn't have to live with their like assaulting abusers or die by their assaulting abuser husbands potentially. So win, win, I would rather walk around forever than be like married to some asshole. So I think, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to call it like a 70% win, even though the punishment sucks. At least just look at taking out with your sisters. Um, it seems like it's, it's not that bad. You're you're wet, though, like all the time, carrying a jug full of water that has holes in it. Uh, So anyways, that's the end of the story. That is the Danaids. That is their story. Um, The story of the two twin brothers who just couldn't fucking get their shit together to do normal things. Because, you know, if they just communicated, maybe um, did some conflict resolution, some like behavioral therapy exercises, they could have maybe got past their like need to compete and not trust each other. Um... And then just arrange the marriages like normal people did back in the day. Um, And it's unfortunate that they didn't because everybody basically dies (laughs) except for the girls and the one son. So it is what it is. Um, I actually had never heard of this story until it was recommended to me. And then I went to go look it up and found that I had actually um, listened to it on a podcast that I listened to a long, long time ago, but like, I just couldn't get it to ring any bells. I had to listen to the episode all over again, but it's a podcast called let's talk about miss baby. So I would recommend it. I love that podcast. Actually, it's one of my favorites. Um, so if you would like to hear her version in the unlike embellished variety i would check that out i did take a lot from her version because it was the most detailed account i could find i found some other stuff like on wikipedia and things like that um to sort of flesh out my understanding of the story a little bit but i got the majority of what i know about the story from her podcast so i would definitely check that out um and it's also important to note i guess as a side note for this story um it features egyptus the colonizer <laughs> because people already existed in egypt um way before the story and this is like greek propaganda where they're like we invented egypt uh we're gonna take credit for that people were already there <laughs> they were there before greece so <laughs> you know like before greece as we know it in the hellenistic time when they wrote this a little bit of a colonization there, but it's okay. This also reminds me of the main ads, uh, who are the like wine drunk, frenzied women who worship Apollo, not Apollo, god dang it, <laughs> who worship Dionysus and are driven mad um, through his like wine and revelry um, to rip apart men that they find in the fields. I just sort of was like, huh. There's 50 women stabbing their wives or 49 women stabbing their husbands. I'm so confused now. I can't talk anymore. I'm very tired. So that's probably what it is. Um, (laughs) There's 49 women who stab their husbands and sort of this big like conspiracy plot and they just sort of rip them apart (laughs) the same way the mine ads like do this for Dionysus. So I was like, yes, I love to see women (laughs) committing murder in ancient Greek myth like girl power like girl boss get it um but it also really reminds me of a story of actual bit of history about uh victorian hat pins and i i don't know maybe like one day i'll do a longer story about it um but for now i'll tell you guys like there used to be those big fancy hats like they would wear in the the old days like in the 1900s and 1800s like in that time frame take yourself back there those big old fancy hats with like the stuffed birds and fruits and all sorts of stuff on their heads and they would be heavy right like they couldn't just pop this heavy ass hat on their head and expect it to stay there all day so they would use these like hairpins to secure the hat to their hair so it wouldn't fall off their heads 
And um, you probably already know what a hairpin is. I didn't really need to explain it to you. But in this context, this is the time period where these hat pins become prevalent. And because these hats were so big, the hairpins would be really big. And they'd be really long, like really long, sharp pins because they have to stab through the hat, you know, through the hair, all this stuff, right? So what would happen <laughs> is these women would have these big giant hats and they'd have these big old hat pins and guys would start to get like fresh with them on like the trolleys or, you know, the streetcars, whatever, the trains, anywhere like spaces were if girls were riding bikes like guys would like chase them down to like harass them because men were menning even then and um anytime these girls would get harassed they would pull out their hat pins and stab these guys and like sometimes they would cause like grievous bodily injury with their hat pins because they were so long and so sharp that like you know the human body's a soft fleshy thing you can put two and two together. So they would stab the shit out of guys for assaulting them. And like, if girls saw other women also being like harassed by men, they would pull out their own hat pin to give them like a quick jab and be like, get the fuck away from her. Um, and it got to the point where like, women started to feel like really empowered by the hat pin. Um, shenanigans to the point where they were like, we're not taking shit from anybody as long as we have these hat pins. So of course, um, men had to step in and be like, <laughs> hold on a second. This hat pin thing is getting a little outrageous. We can't keep menning if you guys are stabbing us. So then they started to like regulate the length of hat pins and be like, you can only have like a six inch pin and it can't be the start stabby kind because I still have the scar from the last time that I got pinned by this lady. So like they would get so like butthurt that they ended up regulating hat pins, which was actually part of the reason that like hat fashion shifted from like big giant like super decorated hats to like more um smaller neater hats because if you don't have your big giant hat pin you can't wear your big giant hat but you can wear like a cute little like pillbox or trilby or something because you don't need a pin for that um but yeah uh that was like just this crazy point in time where like men were being disgusting and women were like i stab you <laughs> i stab you again sir and it just fills me with so much joy and then like when I read or when I listened to the podcast and heard the first like bit about how he got them all pins for their hair I was like yes stab them and then they actually did <laughs> and I followed through all the way so that was just a delightful bit of like synchronicity to actual history um for me and I hope that you guys enjoyed that little bit of information too um I don't know how much more I could actually do an episode on because I just told you guys the whole entire story like maybe I could get some like historical stuff there but that's like work work and I don't know how much work I I can add <laughs> to my workload but it is just an interesting little fact so I hope that you guys enjoyed that and I have now rambled sufficiently and I'm also sleepy so I'm, I'm gonna go to bed and hopefully you hope that this story is not um insane when I edit it together for this video that you are watching if you're watching this version then you know because I'm telling you about it um that I decided it was fine <laughs> um I probably will decide it's fine anyways. I don't really censor myself that much. So as long as it's cohesive, it's in. But uh, I appreciate it. If you made it to the end of the video, I appreciate your faces. And I hope that you guys enjoyed this one. Um, until next time, happy crafting. Bye. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.